practice is something called rewilding. It's a movement that's certainly gaining momentum at the moment. And one of the local enthusiasts is Anselm Gies of Elmore Court. And I'm very glad to say that Anselm is with us now. Hi there, Anselm. Hello. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you. So before we start on rewilding, can we just sort of wind the clock back a bit and uh, tell us about how you actually took on Elmore Court? Because I think it was uh, about 2007 when you actually moved in. Yeah, I, I um, well, the, the house and land have been in my family. Um, well, the house isn't as, as long as this, but it's, it was granted to us um, in the 13th century um, to somebody called Anselm Guys by Henry III. And the house itself dates back to about 1580. And <clears throat> there's a whole quite long story, which I, can, I won't go into right now, but um, my uncle had no children. Um, my father was the youngest of three. And um, Sir John, Uncle John, passed away in 2007, and I was, I was, uh, I, I, I was doing other things. I was running music festivals and DJing around the world, and uh, suddenly this landed on my lap, and it was in fair. It was a kind of half decent order, um, and uh, I moved in and scratched my head for a number of years, wondering what the hell to do with it, and um, and now we run a. Uh, we've been opened as a wedding and events venue in 2013. Um, okay, so uh, maybe we can talk about that a little bit towards the end. But uh, let's talk about rewilding. So, to, hmm. well, what is it exactly? For the, so, the, uh... <clears throat> so, I mean, I I was turned on to it. Um, I, I became aware of it about five years ago, really, as a kind of as an idea. But essentially, the idea is to um, allow land to return back to nature in a way that um, I think agriculture has um, obviously got a very important part of, of how we live, but perhaps um, we have become a little bit uh, sort of apart from nature where we need to be a part of nature, if, if you like that, if, if you yeah, like yeah. That expression. So, um, and what I've I, I mean, I'm very interested in with what we've done at Elmore Court. It's always been a big sustainable thing. So we've, for example, the Gilly Flower, which is the building that we have all the uh, dinner and dancing is made of mud from the fields and timbers from the, our woodlands and all the heatings from the biomass. So it's it's been for me personally, a, a big um, motivator is environmental kind of sustainability. So the idea is, is instead of um, producing food and using land as, the, as, as a food product producer, is we let it go back to nature and it doesn't mean to say that it just becomes a complete mess and there's a big debate over what exactly rewilding means yeah um because obviously the what a pure wild place has an apex predator um and in england we can't really have apex predators in the sense of you know bears and wolves so we are the apex predators so there is a, you know there is a food element to it but the idea is and there's been wonderful um, examples of where this is kind of there's a place called nep in in sussex which has done which is about sort of 20 25 years into it and okay. you kind of the, the 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 bird life the insect life the the you know the number of creatures there is just astonishing if you go in this in the spring you literally cannot sleep beyond four o'clock in the morning because of the bird song and i think we've forgotten that you know when you go to the countryside you think it looks very pretty but actually the, the amount of animals and creatures that are there compared to what there was even 20 30 years ago has diminished massively and that's because of pesticides and the other way the way that we have without really realizing what we're doing i think have been treating the land so i'm very keen on um using some of the estate to to show what can happen if you if we stop interfering and okay. Nature has this amazing ability of literally just pouring back in if we just stop interfering. So, so how many, uh, how big is the hmm. state, for instance, and how, how much of it have you put to, towards rewilding? So with the, the estate is a thousand acres, so it's not a massive estate. Um, and we're doing a quarter of it. So it's 250 okay. acres that we're going we're gonna to do this on. And is it, you, have you actually started it or is it something that you're... We have started. I mean, the, th the funny thing about it is it is an incredibly long term thing. So you're, yeah. you're you know, it's there. The people use this word rewilded. And I think there is no such thing as rewilded because that suggests there's been an end point reached. Yeah. Um, and we started literally 
September. So the la land stopped being farmed. And essentially what we've done is just stop. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> if you don't like hard work, it's a very good thing to do because you don't have to do anything at all <laughs> for um, that's only for a while. So, I mean, we're, we're probably, we probably won't do anything for three or four years for, for the majority of it. And we'll just let nature run its course. And then after a time, we will start introducing um, hardy herbivores. And the idea is, is if you, so there's no fields, you let the, and the hardy herbivores are animals that can overwinter outside um, so longhorn cattle, Tamworth pigs, Exmoor ponies, um, and various deer, all of which can survive all year round outside. And obviously, if you don't, if you put too many of them there, there won't be enough food. Mm -hmm. So it's about getting the right balance, which is kind of what happens in nature itself. Um, yeah. But in the absence of an apex twin predator, they will breed, and that's where we will get some incredibly very, um, you know, pasture-fed, uh, free-range meat from. So. Um, and so, so those animals shape the land and the landscape and yeah. all the rest of it. So there is a, a an element of management, but it's a very light touch. Yeah, as there's a very lovely chap called Alistair Driver, who uh, is the director of, of an outfit called Rewilding Britain. And he said, look, you mustn't be afraid of managing, but you've just mm. got to ask yourself whether the decision or the act that you're doing is that... Um, obstructing nature and biodiversity or is it supporting it and if it's supporting okay. it then you should be doing it um and sometimes it's a bit of a gray area as to you know you can be a bit like hang, hang on is this the right decision but i think if, as long as the intention is along those lines you're broadly speaking making the right moves yeah. and um have you seen any changes yet i mean it's obviously it's very early to say but i'm thinking about birds maybe have you spotted anything yet as yet well, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I've learned one quick lesson already. We, we, uh, we, somebody's advised us that we should perhaps be doing something called green hay spreading, where you, we had, so we call all the fields we haven't didn't have um, any barley or wheat on, and had quite a nice, um, you know, it's sort of almost like a wild meadow. And once we harvested in September, we actually cut those fields and just literally dropped the green hay onto the very recently harvested wheat and barley fields. <clears throat> um, and I subsequently thought that perhaps it, that was me interfering, you know, it's kind of like engineering a bit, that that was perhaps a mistake um, mm. because I've now spread a lot of grass seed, but also wildflowers and the rest of it. But a lot of that has already come on. And actually, the, if you walk across the fields, and you look and literally get down into the earth. The difference between the ground and other fields nearby, you can see there's a lot more different wow. creatures and, and plants and all the rest of it. So I think it's a very, very early doors. Yeah. But, um, and as you say, it's a, it's a long term project, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, NEP, I've been to NEP and they, they've got fields where they didn't put any seed and, and there's very little grass there. It's extraordinary. It's a bit like walking around the African bush. You can hear animals, but you're not quite sure where you are. It's amazing. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, they're 20, 20 years in. Yeah. Um, and the process is still happening. So uh, it's a kind of rest of my life job, this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not bad. That's not a bad job to have, I would think. Um, yeah. At some point, would you, I mean, I, I understand that in the Forest of Dean, for instance, they've introduced beavers back into some of the streams. I mean, is it, would it be something that you might consider? Are there any, any sort of animals that you might actually reintroduce? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of beavers. I mean, I think the problem is, is that we, we, the waterways that we have are ditches and yeah. drainage ditches. And um, I've got to bear in mind that those drainage ditches are so that water in the local community can actually get out into the River Severn. And I think if the beavers decided to put a dam across <laughs> the River Severn itself, that might raise an eyebrow. But I, 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 th I think, um, you know, I mean, water voles and I, I you know, there, there are um, pine martens. I'd love to see some pine martens or stuff. And I know they're in the Forest of Dean. I'm thinking of maybe putting a big tree across the River Seven so they can run across <laughs> um, and join us. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think beavers may, will probably not be here, but yeah. we'll see. Okay. What about um, reaction of your neighbours, I mean, farming neighbours in the Vale, for instance? Anybody, have you had a chance to talk to them about it at all? Yeah. Um, Broadly speaking, actually, we've had quite a lot of support. Um, I think in a funny sort of way, 
one of the things that is more of a surprise is that because my family have been here for such a long time and the relationship of the guises with the local community and the farmers has always been very much that they that the land is tenanted and yeah. i think there's a i i i i've had a little bit of a like you know a, a gentle prod shall we say that perhaps i shouldn't be i should be allowing the farmers to continue to tenant the land mm. in terms of what i'm actually doing um there's a couple of fields that actually um have you know the soil's pretty good and there's you know and i i i've had to kind of battle with myself a little bit as to whether i should be doing this rather than doing food production on it but it, i'm yeah. slightly limited by what land i can actually get in hand yeah so um yeah no, no um financial help from defra or anybody like that for this sort of plan is there or yeah is there... There, there there is yeah yeah we're um the um natural england and through the rpa um there's various different kind of countryside stewardship um yeah. um options that are still available right now and we're 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 in the process of applying for that for something called the WD6, which is um, creation of woodland pasture, which would be very helpful. Yeah. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of change going on with all the subsidies and the end of the common agricultural policy, and and yeah. um, <clears throat> and you know the introduction of elms and all that sort of stuff, which is. Yeah. But I, I think yeah we you know I, there's not many of us doing what I'm doing yet, and I think broadly speaking, there's quite a lot of support for it. Good. Um, you mentioned money then. I don't like to raise it, but, um, you know, you've said, I think, at the start of our chat that the, your business is very much now an entertainments and weddings venue. I think everybody looking at this little film will feel for you because your business of all businesses has been hit so hard by COVID. And I'm just mm. wondering whether, you, you know, you, you can see the next few months, you know, how do you how do you see it going? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I... I I am a, I'm an optimist um, and a re but also I'm a realist and uh, you know the next few months are going to be tricky. However, you know the the risk it seems to me uh, of COVID is more to the more elderly and, and obviously the vulnerable and obviously and you know we're, I'm just hoping that they the government can get the vaccinations out to reduce the risk of death to a point. But uh, there's still a kind of question mark over well what happens to all the younger people yeah. we don't want to get covid even if it's not going to be so no, yeah. you know, risky so I, I i don't know but i we've been hit really very badly by it um and i i think um you know more so than um hotels and restaurants which um don't have kind of existing clients i mean our big problem is that we've we've got a lot of existing clients um and couples and a lot of whom have postponed now four times <clears throat> and yeah. uh, obviously they're they're very worried about their weddings so we furloughing um like a lot of places can do because they can just literally shut up and reopen we can't so um that's been a real struggle to sort of manage our couples but i'm i um will get through it um and i'm very focused on doing this rewilding thing we've got tree house tree houses that are going to be going with it and um I, and i you know the thought of not being able to do this sort of stuff with the land um is what really you know that stresses me out and upsets me and i'm very determined not to be derailed from it so we'll see but i th i think we'll be i think we'll be back to like a proper normal by the end of this year i just i'm not quite sure how the summer's going to go you know we'll see <laughs> thank you very much indeed for talking to us today good luck thank you very much indeed thanks for having me take care bye-bye